волновать. Good evening. This is Yulia Latinina and Alexei Aristovich on Latinina TV. As we usually have this guest on Wednesdays, day 154. What should we start with, Alexei? From something good or something bad? Whichever you like. All right, let's start with what I think is bad, because as far as I understand, Russians took Ugligorska electric facility, electric plant. I uh, had a guest yesterday who was explaining why this opens an opportunity to encircle part of your defense group. I'm sorry for taking it uh, straight to the heart of it, uh, but I just talked to the person who fought there. Uh, he's one of the infantrymen. He says that uh, his small detachment uh, had significant losses, half of them were wounded. Russian uh, Wagner private army is uh, seeping through in small groups. They bringing uh, mortars with them. It is difficult to hit them with any artillery because they're small groups. They also have 150 caliber artillery hitting at Ukrainian positions. Uh, I did ask him about Ukrainian artillery and he answered that uh, it was taken out by Russians and uh, he also said Russian jets were uh, pretty active but they're not too accurate although one of them did drop uh, munition about uh, 15 meters away from them I don't know if it was uh, 59 or whatever it was there were no uh, analysis and that, but basically he says that half of his detachment got wounded during that hit. And he did uh, say that uh, it's Wagner uh, groups that are seeping through, in his opinion, rather effectively. And this uh, big Ukrainian machine that supposedly is uh, fighting pretty effectively cannot really um, do anything against that method of attack and the detachments that they had next to them they withdrew without even uh, notifying these guys and I can't even listen I can't hear Alexei Alexei could you turn something on or move the microphone I cannot hear what he is saying I suspect it is on his side. Oh. I, Alexei, I, yeah, I think we have him. I think we have his voice. Alexei, you're back. Please don't mute me. Maybe that affects him somehow. Yes, Alexei, we can hear you. All right. Now let me translate from emotional to understandable. That whole story of taking Ugladar electric plant as uh, the mood and emotional appeal that your correspondent told you, uh, it supply supports usual military data. If you're using strategic munitions to acquire tactical objects, that's what happens. If commander is not too effective defending position, you can lose even a bigger object than that. If your neighbors to the left and the right withdraw without letting you know, that can be hard. If commanding group of that sector doesn't consider it is important to fight with the enemy and would rather withdraw. That could be a tactical decision or could be just bad management. Statements that Wagner troops are effective is really emotional. There are no detachments in Russian army that are effective and effectively taking uh, ob uh, plants and other objects. 
However, we do have our own commanders in the Ukrainian army who, for some reason, could not hold that position. And uh, why did they give it? And then also, why did they not withdraw together with the neighbors to the left and right to better positions? Sounds like a normal uh, military mess. And uh, the way we lost it, we will take it back. And I wouldn't even mention it, uh, but yesterday I had Alex Danov explaining why this uh, plant is somewhat of a key position that creates uh, a risk of encirclement of some of the Ukrainian troops. Which troops? Do you have uh, any notions of what troops are uh, at risk near Novolugansk? Yes, they have some Russians on the right flank. We had same things near Gorsky and Zolotoya when they almost got encircled, and then we withdrew them at the opportune moment. I don't see why shouldn't we repeat the same process here. I do not see tragedy with this specific motion. This is an episode, pretty regular episode of a big continental war. We lost Mariupol, um, Uglidarska, electric center, electric plant is not too big of a loss compared to that. Um, soon Russian troops will have to get a taste of that same medicine and start losing their stuff. I understand that for fighters who are defending that position it is a tragedy. It is a tragedy for them, a tragedy for their family, since their friends are wounded, they are wounded, somebody might be killed. But on the strategic level I don't see a big issue here. We lost that, that uh, point, we'll get it back. If you're looking on a big uh, frame, in a big framework, Russian army already lost this conflict. Even if they take that plant or take Siversk, which I don't think will happen, but even if they do that, this will not change the outcome of this war. This is already a final, somewhat finalized uh, outcome. It is more about the tempo of formation and documentation of this loss. Do you know that right now, these days, there's a big move happening in the Russian side, and most troops, they're relocating to Kherson and Melitopol area, because they're expecting our counter strike down there. The Donetsk front, which uh, had so much input to capture the rest of this territory and add it to the Russian crown jewel, they stopped all these attempts, they cancelled them. And that's where we can switch to the good news and tone of bridge and perspectives of surrounding of Russian troops in Kherson. What is happening down there? Nothing too major is happening there. They are moving a lot of their troops in that area. Everything they can take off from Zaporozhye, from Izum, from the Eastern Front, where they could not uh, succeed in 400 days, they decided it's not uh, a point to keep them there, and they're moving all these troops to Kherson area, and we're starting to isolate this war theater in hopes to keep those troops there and bury them there. Right now, this bridge is incapable of letting heavy equipment in. They only have two bridges left, railroad and tunnel bridge, which uh, they're sending equipment through. Very low uh, throughput capacity, but they're basically putting railroad uh, wooden uh, blocks over the rails and uh, driving over them. And they're also sending some troops over Novokakhovska Dam, and they have a bridge near Daryevka and the pontoon. So three points which can be easily controlled by our artillery and and some time I don't think any Wagner troops will be able to help them, even if they put all of them there. You know, when I personally when I hear all these scary names of Russian Wagner, Wimpel. Alpha and others, I get a uh, healthy disdain of an infantry officer who thinks in about that way that a 152 millimeter shell doesn't care how professional you are. 
and how many years of preparation you have and how what's your experience but uh, it's just important that you do meet that one that shell well here's the problem that sometimes uh, they don't meet these shells yes when commanders on the front are idiots that's what happens it happens if you think that all Ukrainian commanders are all Guderians, Rommels and whatever Russians are paying us to be uh, we're not what uh, Stalin said in a similar situation he said we do have I know you do want Hindenburg to be leading the troops I don't have one we are fighting with what we have all right so we you are fighting with what you have and then maybe you can elaborate more in the other areas, not just in Oglegorsk and uh, near Antona Bridge. They're also trying to storm Siversk and Bakhmut. doesn't work for them, get kicked back. In three weeks they moved maybe 2.5 kilometers, and not because they pushed us out, but because our army withdrew to a more uh, logical positions to straighten the front. So overall they're just uh, getting their asses handled to them. Vysokopoly is taken by your troops, but there is no surround of Russian uh, detachment. No, uh, Vysokopoly is still that protrusion in the south that we thought they'll be captured. Um, it's still Russian. Uh, we still around it, but it's not exactly like Ilovaisk. There was no exact isolation of the whole theater. Our troops were too far from that. Here it's almost direct contact of uh, semi-encircled troops with the main group and uh, more professional uh, commanders could have used it to a bigger effect but right now they do have a weak situation there Russian troops cannot withdraw even though they're trying in small groups and ours cannot take it but they can pinch them pretty painfully as they're retreating without replacing the commanding officer in that position it is difficult to expect a success for us there so you think that Russian troops near her son sorry for interrupting you near Siversk for example we do have a good commander so we do have some good success there they've been disciplining Russian troops and started teaching them good lessons there it really depends upon the commanding officer in the area so and besides that what do you mean besides that oh on the other parts of the front everything else is normal there is a bit of emotion on the north of Kharkov the usual field work nothing worth specifically highlighting so concentration of russian troops near Novak kahovka do you expect them to be taking defense positions or do you think they will start advancing uh try attempting to push where it's an interesting fork right now if you look at it strategically you can see in general outline the idea of russian command they are going to switch to strategic defense and it will take some time probably those infamous two three weeks but um, the question is whether they'll try to attack us with uh, their current group before they switch to surrender mode or will they try to stop our uh, plans for offensive just by their defense and uh, force us to somewhat of a peaceful agreement something that Minsk 3 agreement this is this appears to be the main task of Russian command and me personally so far I think it is still to be verified that they will try to switch to strategic defense throughout the whole front line but they'll probably try to push uh, make one or two hits on our positions to try to destroy some of our advancing capacity and uh, graduate this whole situation to a no-win 
it would be interesting if they switch to a complete defense position. That would mean that a good success for us. That means they're really out of offensive capacities. By the way, do you know how uh, Wagner uh, detachments get their reputation? I'll tell you. So there is a story as if uh, Papasna was also taken by Wagner. So LNR and DNR guys do most of the work. They destroy everything they can. Artillery just keeps shelling and leveling everything. And when there is just a small semi-dev, semi-destroyed, semi-dead group is left, they send Wagner to clean up. And that's how they create the name for that group. When the card house is almost destroyed, then Wagner comes in and pushes the last card and the remnants of this house fall down. And then there are stories about Wagner, how they're professional, how they're strong. All the victories Russia had in this war were done by um, down on the ground infantry, Ivan on the ground who came with his boots and planted a flag somewhere or captured something. So that infantry actually does the most part. Everything else is just in service of that infantry, including special forces. And why would Russian army lift that reputation of Wagner? It is not Russian army. It is the agreement up above. The troops are being managed not by their high command, not by military command. They're managed by their political leadership. So if that's why, how political leadership is telling them to manage it, that's how they go in to do it. So Putin basically commands Russian military to not shine much and lift uh, Wagner up. No, Putin says that major troops need to do all the work and then at the end let Wagner to plant the flag and kick ass and uh, get the name. Because you are not, guys, uh, put in Putin's opinion, the rest of his military is not going to Africa, Syria and other places. And it is just Wagner who will travel out. So they're creating a name for that group because that's the brand. And for the most part, they are comprised of hired guns. And as for the officers, they're officers on the military intel group and that's uh, and that's how it works there because the head of uh, intel is also subordinate to the head of the military uh, command so if putin decides they need to do they will go and do it so russian troops are being th moved down south right yes uh, i said at the beginning they've been moving there for five days already and we're planning to bury them down there isn't it i'm sorry dislocation and relocation of the troops to a strategic trap yes and this is very good they finally made a strategic mistake in this war a strategic one the first strategic was let's say the beginning of this war in itself and the second happened when they recently made this decision that was inevitable and that's why i'm talking about it openly because there are people going to be screaming in the comments saying why why are you prompting russians what to do they cannot stop it they got an order from above so they'll just follow it their position is to get in defense and try to push us to a negotiation table. So I can only shake their hand and say, good job. We, we really needed that. And this is not just about Kherson, it's about the whole relocation of the forces on the front. I think they're idiots, for real. Uh, I have mentioned it before, but I'm, uh, I was brought up in a military family. I was brought up in a understanding that your enemy has honor, you have to respect them. But frankly, looking at what Russian army does, I need to make an effort to remember that there are officers on the other side too. There are generals and soldiers, because otherwise it's an encyclopedia of idiocy. I do know military history pretty well, a lot of battles and details. 
I can hardly remember any military force doing the same amount of mistakes that the Russian army does. And they need to see, and they will see it in a short period of time that with this approach to performing military tasks, they should not even come to Ukraine. They should stay near Voronezh and practice it there. But it's good. As Napoleon said, you need two things for victory, luck and stupid opponent. It appears that we do have both right now. All right, so we did promise our listeners to return back to the question of uh, traitors in the military system of Ukraine. And before we switch to that, I thought it was going to be a main question of this stream. I do need to ask you about the number of mistakes that Russian army made. Could you mention your opinion the most noteworthy? Uh, because it is five months of this war where Putin was going to take Kiev in three days. And if you can, a brief overview of uh, errors that turned this war into what we see that. Mistakes from our side? Oh, from, from Russian side. If they were yours, of course, bring them up. I'll talk about ours later, after the war. I already to told Fagin that uh, the most interesting streams will become after the war, when we'll start, when we'll actually have a chance to say things we cannot say now. But speaking of uh, Ukrainian forces, that the way they lost their capacity and became what they are, I can do a deep dive on that. So in the ex-USSR countries, there were only two countries where police minister, minister of internal affairs over to KGB. It's Ukraine. In every other country, it's either a balance between two uh, services, two agencies, or KGB took over. So the reason why it happened different in Ukraine is because of several factors. One is Ukraine mentality. The second is Russian KGB attempt to try to bring down the Ukrainian KGB. So when USSR fell apart, main push was on the fifth detachment about looking for counterintelligence. We basically had people who were concerned more with ideology and dissidents because generally intelligence and special operations they were mostly concentrated in Moscow. Counterintelligence and intelligence, first and second. We only mostly had fifth, which is uh, dissidents and ideology. What is fifth de department? This is mostly um, academia coming in, uh, psychologists, uh, humanitarian studies, people who are mostly in charge of uh, political statements and general philosophy of that. Just like in a classic Soviet movie where two uh, counterintelligence uh, agents talk with in uh, special language, nicely dressed, drinking champagne. So that's what our detachment number five was. And what is power? Power is fight. So when they started fighting and dividing the fields of influence, these uh, philologists, uh, when they were pitted against the proper police guys, they failed. They blatantly failed to Minister of Internal Affairs. Our police was and still is a huge corporation, which has very high level of corporate connections, and they do play a very high role, just similar to the way military play in Turkey, for example. Um, in Ukraine, two policemen may hate each other for whatever reason, but they will help each other if need be. In uh, Ukrainian KGB, the 5th Detachment, the department, they didn't do that way. They were fighting with each other, they were fighting with everybody else outside. So our Minister of Internal Affairs grew like crazy. It included emergency services, National Guard with guns, 
and um, Ukrainian SBU uh, KG, version of KGB was small, powerless, and very puny. And they didn't have anything to counterimpose to the influence of police. They somewhat revived when uh, Detachment K was joined, added to them, which was uh, tax police and economic uh, investigations. But the rest remained weak. So in all the influence areas, they were much weaker. Less people went to district attorney, to taxes, services, to police. And over there, they had people who wanted to play that contactless counterintelligence and ideology. Since service of Ukraine safety, SBU, was, had some counterintel tasking, so somewhat they were affecting the Russian agent's influence. But it was happening during the times when nobody believed that Russia is interested in doing anything with Ukraine. And many of them were in uh, on, uh, the highest level of government. Just looking at the recent arrests on the highest level of cabinet of ministers, um, back then it was even worse. So our KGB was much weaker, SBU, um, but they were still of interest to Russian counterparts. They used them as a tool, um, so they still continue to exist. And some of them remain their connections, retain their connections with Russian counterparts because they studied together, they knew each other, they worked together before. So personal corporate connections were always present. And uh, there was also another group that was uh, hired or converted by Russia. And this brought us to a position when uh, Ukraine security service was managed by a Russian citizen, Yekimenko, who is now trying to do stuff down south and towards Crimea. So, as a result, on the 14th after Maidan, half of our SBU even uh, considered these uh, revolutionaries as the government enemies. But at the end of this revolution, SBU arrested 21 top-level officers with the direct uh, data of working for Russian intel services. And this is the year when half of them didn't even want to work, another hard, half were Russian agents. If you remember how many, how easy uh, the centers for Ukraine KGB, Ukraine uh, SBU were given to Russians in Lugansk and Donetsk areas, including weapons, you'll get the picture. But Eventually, especially during these events of 2014, there were people who grew in Ukraine who wanted to show themselves and prove themselves. They started fighting back, and some of them were showing really good uh, stories, good uh, working success. So we started having islands of common sense in SBU. Now it is at the fork. Who's going to win there? Will it be patriots who are ready to play hard games according to our current situation with uh, the military situation where it's contact, uh, rough counterintelligence, which assists in survival of our country, in defending the government structures, in defending the information system, hunt, find and destroy the Russian influence. And they were successful in doing that already. Or would the second wing prevail, the ones the ones which are not so contactful, uh, the ones who prefer ideology uh, under the carpet agreement, or there could be some parity. Some some groups will have teeth and others will not, and will report something like, "Oh, we found 30 liters of stolen gasoline with one of the." 
uh, lieutenants in the military instead of finding the Russian agents. So SBU is at the fork. Now they're figuring where to go. I am frankly a proponent of a more harsh approach because it is a military situation and that's what needs to be done in order to defend our country. But we'll see which one prevails. It's not me making these decisions. But me personally is definitely interested in strengthening our security service. Alexei, when we talked last time about resignation of Bakanov, you did say some very concrete things about Russian citizens who were ministers. There were three Russian citizens who were ministers of Ukraine. And I was expecting that you might tell us some of the uh, very peculiar details, maybe from Yanukovych times. And now you're somewhat sneaking out with the general statements. People want to uncover masks. Well, Yulia, I understand your sentiment, but I cannot uh, name some things which are not being prosecuted yet because I'm, it's not just me making a statement now, it's the office of the president who would be making the statement. Even if I refer it's mine, there'll be media saying it's the president's office opinion. I can give you a name like Shaitanov, which I did mention before. He was the general and he behaved real strangely near Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. And according to whom, because of whom Kramatorsk could have been captured and he worked with Girkin and other Russian terrorists and then he was finally unmasked and there was a volumes of uh, proof and different materials against him and you need to understand that generals never walk alone so an asset of this caliber he has a task of uh, converting more agents the general of special service converted and caught that's not a joke that's a serious story Oleg Kulinich, uh, who was arrested, uh, the guy who moved to try to move to Crimea and live there, and who gave up uh, most of the southern territories to Russia. So there are results. We caught Medvedchuk, right? And there are many other things happening. Which may not tell an average viewer too much, but we can see the general direction to where the wind is blowing. That security service needs to have teeth. And those attempts to assassinate Zelensky uh, that you wrote at the beginning of the war were there active secret service, uh, accurate uh, special service people? They were no active, they were ex. Uh, servicemen of those agencies. They were the core of some of these diversion groups, the ones from uh, Yanukovych times. They knew the territory, they spoke Ukrainian, and there were tens of them. Were there any of them active? Any? Oh, no, the question would be, did active SBU servicemen help to capture these guys? How well did they show themselves? Counterintelligence showed itself brilliantly. If not for them, we would not be able to achieve it. Counterintelligence is not SBU, is it? It is. It is one of the departments of counterintelligence of SBU. All right. So that is clear. How Mark Fagan likes to say. And another subject that we want to mention since we're talking about intel operations. It's uh, Hrista Grozev, who, with the help of Klofelin and $4,000, was trying to hijack Russian jet. I understand this has no relation to SBU. I understand it was done by some people in Russia who were inventing this story. Or were they? Uh, and did they resign? Yeah, that's uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian figures who invented it. Um, I recognize style of General Vasya, who at first was trying to land the plane with Wagner uh, troops. This is amazing, right? We should you should have been appointed him as the head of SBU. I think if we did, that would be the last day of SBU. 
Our president actually mentioned in press conference that Burba, Vasily Burba came to him in 2000, uh, 2020 and said that he stole a uh, variant of coronavirus and he suggested to scare Russians or Americans for some operation. So that's his level. That's that's what he does. Or when uh, they, so another guy was Gardon was taking a journalist was taking an interview with Paklonska and Girkin. He was saying that he's recording some materials from that interview for Hague Tribunal. I should remind you, he was one of the planners to clean up Maidan back in the day as the head of SBU when. He was when Yanukovych was president. The general was the head of uh, K department in charge of the economic uh, offenses, and he was appointed to be the head of uh, cleanup of Maidan, our revolution. And according to some data. He was uh, hosting some of the Russian agents and helping them to work against Maidan. So here I'm talking as Alexei Rostovich, as an informal person, not as a representative of the office. Uh, there are some rumors. And this is still rumors because you do need to prove all these steps. These are rumors, you know. Uh, it either has to be an accusation or he'll be told that your mark prevented Urba from doing complete genius operation and I personally uh, sarcasm here I think it was a genius operation I frankly don't care about what people will say if I did I would not be working what I do work um, and my I, I do care about smart people and my counterparts but even that Wagner operation it does uh, reveal all the gigant aspirations of General Vasa, who is go yeah, who was thinking about special operations of landing Turkish planes on the Ukrainian territory, forced landing, uh, a few days before our president's visit to Turkey. So this takes special genius to do things like that. So, the fact that uh, people like Vasily Burba, the General Vasa, which is the equivalent of General Johnny, um, would uh, be a good de descriptor of how spectacular was uh, SBU in those years, and spectacular and not serious. All right, since. We're going in the direction of uh, intrigue and rumors, which I'm trying to stay away from because me personally, as a Russian journalist, I think it's not my business. But on the other hand, I think it's important. Uh, Julia, uh, most journalists do look into intrigue of uh, Ukrainian power. You're the one who trying to withhold and take keep distance from it. Well, you and probably Mark are trying to stay away from that politics. I would say that in general, if inside Ukrainian power people are starting to fight, it means that uh, victory is within grasp, within reach. Because while the days were hard and long, there was no inner fighting, right? Uh, yes. Now, I cannot pass by another story, a new letter of a congresswoman, Victoria Sparks, who wrote a letter to President Biden that Yermak concentrated too much power, that Venediktova and Bakanov were removed because of him, that Korban and Robinovich were... Uh, citizenship was taken away from. So, I have two questions. I do like Kurba, so I was wondering if I can ask you these questions. I'm trying to avoid this intrigue. And if I had a chance to address President Biden with a request to aid Ukraine, I would probably tell him, President Biden, give more weapons. I would not be writing him letters about who, whom, how, in what position. I don't care uh, how much power your mark has in his hands. 
it has nothing to do with what is happening on the front and what's happening near Uglegorsk and Antonov Bridge. And that's the one. The second is that she, in a previous letter, accused Yermak to be a Russian agent. What happened with this accusation? What is that mysterious woman who let the previous accusation forgo and knows all the details again? And she's a congresswoman of states, but she is behaving as, of a, as an editor of a local Ukrainian newspaper. All right, let's uh, take this apart. Uh, his statement, Yermak, has too much power in his hands. How do you understand that? Yermak is manager of the Ukrainian president. He is his political advisor and he is providing for all the executive work being done on behalf of the president. If you have questions to Yermak, you need to address them to Zelensky because Yermak there is only because of Zelensky. That means Zelensky is satisfied with his progress. How much power, how, do, how does he see his power? He's president's manager. Well, I'm not uh, answering this question because I don't want to go into that snake pit. So, if to follow the logic, the accusation should be falling on the president's head. Because if you, he's holding that uh, Russian agent with a lot of power in his hands, um, it means president is happy with him, right? Um, note that he replaced the head of SBU, the guy who lived with him in the same uh, complex, he replaced with another. He doesn't have issues with replacing people in power. So if he is working, if your mark is working, means he is satisfying president with his results. Now, a question. Who needs to be ahead of the office in Ukraine? The person who satisfies Ukrainian president or the one who satisfies a congresswoman in the United States? I think the answer is clear. If uh, Yermak is ever uncovered as a, a revealed to be a Russian spy, he will be punished as a Russian spy. Otherwise, if he just failed to do something politically, he can be fired. So why do these people are so nervous? I need to refer to several facts. Yermak is the lead on the American direction for a Ukrainian president. America has 19 intel services. Do you think they know whom they're dealing with? I suspect they do know better than Congresswoman's parts. I'm sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> Couldn't stand on the side. And what share of their work is dedicated to researching your mark and the whole office, including myself. Speaking of American secret services and uh, intel services. And there are a lot of rumors. The president was told that your mark is a big spy and accused of all the deadly scenes, but apparently there is no proof. And the thing is, with democracies is they're very often likely to believe the opponent with some shocking data than their friend with, uh, who is repudiating it. And that, to a degree, is a force of a democracy, but that also brings interesting distortions. And, you know, if your mark at some point would turn to be Russian, spy, that will be a situation that will be, books will be written about, because if to analyze the actions of this person, uh, one can clearly see that uh, that person caused them more harm than ever did good. Sanctions, Yermak, most of the weapons assortment coming here, Yermak, political connections Ukraine is building with allies, Yermak. I'm at a loss to even mention everything that he does. It is really bad generally to have an agent like that who does more harm than good. All right, let's also compare what Yermak knows. Does he know his military plans? No, not to the end. Military command does not reveal that. Nomenclature of the weapons being thrown to Ukraine? Not in details, probably general outline, yes. Sanctions? Yeah, he might know sanctions. Sanctions are being implemented, agreements are done, weapons are coming, 
uh, no major issues with the military operation. So as an agent of what of an influence, what is he influencing, which processes internally in Ukraine that uh, would help Russia to win this war? The fact that Russians are losing strategically, that's not his issue. If Ukraine was not uh, preparing for the war, how are we resisting for five months already and destroyed uh, an equivalent of five armies here on our territory? So all these accusations, they cannot withstand the pure logic. And there is life, there is real life, and then there is real life with, uh, that uh, you and I deal with. But then there is life in the heads of those accusa accusers. See, most people, when they uh, blame your mark for doing or not doing something, they don't see that in person. I do. I'm there daily and I see what he does. And I think I do uh, know people pretty well. And while nobody is looking, I'm also pretty savvy in uh, spycraft. So if he turns out to be a spy, he'll be a unique spy in the world history. He'll be a genius spy who brought more harm than uh, good to his side. I'm, I cannot refutate that, but again, that's a question to the counterintelligence specialists and our allies, not mine. Also, if I did want to attack your mark, I would have done it more artfully than their opponents are trying to do. Because like every of us, he has real issues, just like every other person. But I cannot indicate those now. I don't point at weaknesses that people I work with. <laughs> or because the, these are more uh, experienced people and like Russian army and they might use this advice. No, they won't. But uh, it's good that we talked about it. So I appreciate the conversation. This is Yulia Latinian and Alexei Aristovich. I forgot to say subscribe to our channel because when you do it during the stream, it uh, is uh, given to more viewers. And I think this conversation is worth it about Yermak and Burbach. I agree with you about Yermak, but I am a different opinion regarding Burba. But this is beautiful. I think it's that's what's called democracy when people can disagree. When people can throw shit at each other and then still remain friends. Um, don't forget to subscribe to Alexei's channel. We have 38,000 watching us live. We'll be wrapping it up soon, but I do have important, but not too short of questions. Alexei, what can you tell to those people in Russia who feel for Ukraine, but they also think that Ukraine is doomed because the West doesn't give enough shells. There is not enough Western weaponry. Russia has a ton of those weapons, just like Uglegorsk. They're using strategic weapons on the tactical targets and they keep coming and coming and coming. And the shells on the Ukrainian side to the old Russian guns are running out because they will. And Russia, unlike Ukraine, has tons of those shells since Second World War. What would you answer them? I don't want to name names, but these things were told to me by some very concrete opponents who sort of support Ukraine. Absolutely. I think they're hypnotized by the fairy tale of Red Army, the winner, because Soviet Army was a winner when Ukraine was part of that army. Russia itself has never won in the last hundreds of years a single war without Ukraine being part of it, except maybe Georgia. Um, so I want to say that powder shelf life is 25 years. So you can save that, but uh, the last live ammo that is worthy was manufactured in uh, 1994. So you can have a ton of them, but they will not be shooting. I would suggest 
wait a month, Yulia. Let's take one exact month. So, August, Wednesday the 24th, Independence Day. Very good day. Let's talk to you then about how mighty Russian army uh, wins this war. And the second question before we conclude, I'm also not naming my opponent that I talked to, who also feels for Ukraine, who thinks that the West will uh, force Ukraine, will be a traitor and will force Ukraine to sign a peace treaty of the 24th of February. You know, Yulia, signing according to the border of 24th of February will not be traitors shipped to Ukraine. It will be a good victory, because by that time Russian army uh, would have suffered the uh, biggest defeat in its history, not even comparing the Japanese uh, war where they lost, where some faraway expeditionary garrisons were fighting and being sunk by a uh, Japanese fleet. I should remind that since Japanese war, Russia has never lost a flagman in the ocean until Ukraine. So, if that is a traitor ship, if we take back everything before to before the 24th of February, um, let them push for that. So, you're satisfied with the borders of February 24th as intermediate borders? Yeah. We'll do the next episode after, which, you know, may start immediately after we get to these borders. Sorry for interrupting. These people of yours, they are somewhat in the mental field of propaganda pushed by Kremlin. I understand I uh, know Russian reality and the fact that their propaganda towers are beaming day and night. It drives crazy even the most uh, sane people. But I do wish them mental health, good logic and a more healthy outlook on life. Because otherwise these people start consuming myths of the old uh, Moscow squares. I think these people don't watch Russian TV, Alexei. Well, it doesn't matter, Julia. They might listen to some dissidents or feed on some insights from Kremlin, but all these insights are being well organized. When I read insights in our Telegram channels about the presidential office, I don't know to cry or to laugh. Uh, if somebody brings it to me, I nod and politely say thank you for bringing it to me, because basically I do know who and how is doing that and who is inventing them and for what reason. This is a very organized thing, just like every court is sending rumors about itself. Same thing is in Russia, except for there it is very well organized under a single strategic umbrella. I suggest, I offer them to listen to Yulia. She's one of the better analysts that I've met in my media life. And she has a very good logical outlook on things, than, rather than these uh, scary insights about the West being traitors or Russia winning with ancient weapons stockpiled after the Second World War. Alexei, I personally don't think the West will uh, leave you. I think you'll take as much territory as you guys like. But I'm very upset about Uglygorsk, personally. I think the same as defeat under Papasne. This is a significant thing that may, might cause uncomfortable tactical consequences. Uh, maybe tactical and operative, not strategic. Personally, Yulia, I don't think they'll even get to operative just because of the ratio of forces in this front. I would love you to be right, Alexei. I, I pray you're right. Um, so it was Yulia and uh, Alexei. Do not forget to subscribe. Big thanks. Don't forget to subscribe to the private here station if you're watching that in English. Uh, share the links and you might want to check out a two-hour video about the history of Byzantine that I posted on Monday and leave your likes, comments and 
If you want to know about uh, Russian nuclear wonder waffles, uh, we'll be preparing that video, uh, including that new Russian submarine that is supposed to be the carrier of new nuclear missiles. Do you want that to be a full two-hour cast or maybe three separate 40-minute uh, streams? It was Yulia Latinina. Tomorrow we'll have Andrei Piankovsky and we'll have more things to talk about. Thanks again. Have a good evening. Subscribe, like and share. This was not an easy conversation. Goodbye. Да, да. Вот у меня ощущение, да, что если вы ушли из эфира, то вырубил все более стоящий звук. Нет, это не так. Я я все время был отсутствовала. Это бы Юля, это было не в этом дело. Это это отваливалось. Я, я... Секунду, даже помолчите, помолчите. Мы выйдем из эфира и продолжим разговор. Где кот галстук спрашивает? Ну что, господа, показать вам кота галстука? Одну секунду тогда. Я показываю вам кота галстука, а то его тут спрашивают. И мы выходим из эфира. Я бы сказал, что я не знаю.